Um, anyway, um, our Circe is involved, and I think you've heard in, in the, certainly in the morning sessions, you've heard about how much our Circe is involved in product development and in regulatory science related to product development, but we also are involved in a lot of post-marketing projects, and you're going to hear at least one post-marketing uh, project right now. So it's my pleasure to introduce our next lightning talk, hopefully lightning, uh, Lee Sanders, who will be talking about pediatric medications and labeling. So Lee. Good afternoon, everyone. I saw a baby enter recently, so it's time to bring in the pediatrician. Um, I, am, uh, I am a pediatrician. I'm also a, a health literacy and health behavior uh, researcher. And I just want to um, acknowledge a couple things from earlier today that relate to my talk. Um, our university president at Stanford, Tessier Levine, talked about a number of cha urgent challenges for drug development. Uh, including the challenge of chronic illness and the challenge of the use of digital technologies, which I'll be alluding to. Um, and Sam Hoggood from UCSF talked about the need to address health equity, and I'm a health disparities researcher. But I think most importantly, Dr. Esserman talked about moving uh, the p-value to patient value. And what I'm going to make an argument for, not just in post-marketing science, but I would say, Kathy, also in in every level of FDA science is the need to apply what we know from social and behavioral science uh, to uh, the development of uh, medications and the information that accompanies them. So addressing health disparities, as Sam alluded to earlier, is a national priority, not just for the FDA, but also for most of the leading health agencies uh, and the institutions Stanford University and UCSF uh, represented here. Low health literacy, which I've spent uh, a good bulk of the past uh, two decades researching, is a common driver for many of these disparities. We know that one in four adolescents and young adults actually have limited health literacy, and those with limited health literacy have difficulty navigating the healthcare system, including the use of medications. FDA's mission itself is to improve self safe medication use for all individuals which requires a special attention to vulnerable populations, not that just those with limited literacy and English language proficiency, but also, also those from underrepresented minorities and children and adolescents and individuals with chronic illness. Unfortunately, little evidence exists to improve um, these disparities and specifically to understand more about how vulnerable populations read, use, and understand medication information. As I alluded to before, and as Dr. Abernathy alluded to when she talked about developing a trustworthy infrastructure uh, within and beyond the FDA, the FDA's mission includes an effort to address literacy-related disparities pursuant to a number of legislative uh, mandates, most uh, particularly the 2012 Medication Safety and Innovation uh, Act. And I'll show you the many FDA officials who have informed the work of our lab all of them, consistent with the FDA, are committed to ensuring access to understandable information for all, including the underrepresented subpopulations I just referenced. As funded by uh, the Searcy UCSF Stanford Collaborative, our health literacy lab has endeavored over the past couple of years to explore the following aims. One, to assess the suitability of medication information commonly used by adolescents and their families. Secondly, to gain perspectives about written information accompanying both prescription and over-the-counter information uh, from those youth and their families in low-income communities. And finally, co-producing with youth and families from low-income communities novel tools to support informed decision-making. So I want to take you on a brief tour of what that looks like in our lab. First, um, there are a number of standardized instruments to assess the understandability of written health information. And for one of our earlier studies, uh, we sampled medication information from more than uh, 40 medications, and these were more than 100 documents, commonly used by children with chronic conditions. And we actually used big data to identify those medications. We looked at, uh, actually, administrative data uh, for all children in California enrolled in the California Children's Program, which is supported by Medicaid and Title V. 
Um, we then assigned three independent reviewers to code that information for its suitability. And this is based on a, a, a tool developed by educators and health uh, professionals. Um, and the unfortunate news re, uh, confirmed some prior work, namely that uh, most of this information fell well below the threshold for understanding at the median reading level for US adults and older adolescents. This included, unfortunately, some of the newer medication guides that FDA had helped to create. So we moved on from that to identify adolescent and parent perspectives on this medication. And to do this, we conducted um, really rigorous qualitative analysis using in-depth interviews of Medicaid-insured teenagers with chronic illness and their parents. And from that qualitative research, several themes emerged. One, that teens found the medication information sheet to be too complex and recommended, as we would expect as health literacy researchers, fewer words, larger fonts, and other mechanisms to improve it. Also, for those of you like me who have teenagers at home, the teenagers wanted to talk a lot about this. They were actually very curious, and they were most curious about medication side effects. They specifically wanted to understand how those side effects affected them with actionable advice tailored to their age and chronic conditions. Third, they sought authoritative information, and they always went to one place, as many of you might be doing in your chairs right now, namely Dr. Google. Um, as Rob Califf alluded to before, these are the adolescents that put in some of the billion searches daily around health information. And finally, um, perhaps not surprising in retrospect, many of them talked about wanting to get information about the interactions between their medications and not only other prescription and over-the-counter medications, but also recreational drugs and alcohol. And finally, um, and this is something that just reminds us about patient-centered care, the teens really wanted to talk about the social stigma associated not just with their disease and their chronic condition, but also their medication use. Several uh, of our respondents reported being bullied about this medication use at school or not being fully able to participate in teen-related activities. So building on these interviews and inviting these adolescents to participate in the process, we applied human-centered design principles in the context of the D school or the design school at Stanford to imagine a redesign of FDA medication information. We did work with our FDA colleagues and we retained all the FDA approved text from the medication information sheet, um, but refashioned it in a web-based format that suggested personally tailored information that included a large navigation menu, cross-platform accessibility, and other features designed by and for our youth. We then collect, conducted a pilot randomized control trial, which is a little unusual in the design process, to examine the impact of this early design on uh, both patient and parent understanding of medication safety indications and side effects. And here's some of our preliminary analysis, and I have to attribute um, one of our uh, uh, students from a low-income community who is now a member of our lab, Kim Ochoa, for doing this analysis, um, as well as conducting some of the interviews. Uh, to summarize the work, you can see on the left a little bit of a, of a sense of the, the small uh, sample size, and, but also the makeup of these community of teens. Um, they were from lower-income communities with struggling with literacy. But they did find that in these very short trials, it's about 10 minutes or so exposed to this redesigned information sheet compared to the existing FDA medication guide, increased understanding of side effects uh, as well as safety, particularly uh, how and when to seek help if they were to experience one of these side effects. And these were from standardized, um, validated tools that we adapted um, for the specific use of this study. So what are the next steps of this sort of research? Well, certainly we want to continue this co-design process and testing in the context of the design school. Um, and we're applying it to over-the-counter medications. I should mention that a, a, 
among my conflicts is that I previously served on the NDAC for uh, FDA. Um, and so I have some interest in that. But we're really working with the FDA to identify uh, how to go about that. We're going to be looking at um, over-the-counter medications with uh, more than one ingredient. Uh, but we're also going to be bringing in new technologies, including natural language processing, um, to allow us to explore across multiple medications the experience of these adolescents um, and how to better fashion understandable information. Out of that, we're, uh, we will embark on a larger comparative effectiveness trial, uh, multi-site in, in underrepresented minority communities, likely using a network of federally qualified health centers. Um, and all along, as I mentioned, we're building a design studio, a design studio that's founded on co-production, um, elevating the voice of underrepresented minority youth, moving them from the characteristic uh, role that they've played as research subjects to actually co-investigators in our work. And I would be remiss if I didn't thank the many people who have taken us this far. So we have the Health Literacy Lab, uh, Michelle uh, Smith, uh, who is a multilingual, multicultural health educator who leads our lab is here. Bonnie Halpern felscher uh, is a PhD uh, health behavior expert um, in adolescent health who's actually been visiting the FDA a lot recently uh, around her expertise around uh, vaping. Uh, behaviors, uh, and a whole host of other folks in the lab. We have clinical advisors, uh, partners, but most particularly our patients and parents who have really gotten involved in this work, and the many members of the FDA Advisory Board that we meet with at least quarterly and sometimes monthly to make sure that the work that we're doing is actionable to the FDA and is moving in a direction uh, that would be most impactful. Um, and finally, I want to thank uh, all of you for your attention and the UCSF Stanford Searcy Collaborative, which really made this work possible. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, yes, can I have the next panel up here? And also there's an announcement, somebody left their cell phone on the registration table out front, so if you're missing a cell phone, it's out there. And, um, the next panel um, is dealing with real-world evidence, artificial intelligence, and novel medical devices, and will be co-chaired or co-moderated by Adam Gazali here at UCSF in neurology, and by the chair of the Searcy, UCSF Stanford Searcy Advisory Board, Ann Wojcicki um, at 23andMe. So yes, you guys go ahead. Did I need to get anything? Great, everyone. Thanks for gathering uh, after lunch. Um, I, I think we're going to put up our... <laughs> I know we'll... Well, here. Good to remind you. So just um, uh, to give a little framework, uh, as you could see, we have an exciting but pretty diverse uh, panel topic that we were charged with. Um, and we have a diverse group of uh, panelists that have very different perspectives. And so our... Um, plan is really pretty straightforward. Each of us, uh, starting with Anna and myself, are going to all take five minutes to discuss those questions from whatever lens you're viewing it. So you could see it varies um, really um, from the opportunities and challenges of, of, of very innovative technologies in the regulatory space, uh, from the uncertainties that we face to the uh, successful examples that we already have that guide us. So. Uh, without further ado, um, and each of our panels will just introduce themselves as we move down, and then that'll give us at least 20 minutes to open it up for interaction with you. Um, I'm Ann Wojcicki. I'm the co-founder and CEO of uh, 23andMe, um, and helping moderate here, so I'll just give a very brief um, summary of, of, of some of the stuff. So in 2012, there was this fascinating um, New York Times article about Target identifying a pregnant teenager before she knew or her father knew. How many of you know about that? I, I, lo I love this story so much. It's just, it's so interesting for me, all that data and how it's used and the fact that all these companies have these predictive analytics teams and they're able to predict really important things about me, like could I be pregnant? So. It was one of those things that got me thinking about like the importance in health 
of us being able to collect all of this data. There's an amazing amount of real world data out there. And then with machine learning and with AI, like how are we gonna process this? Like at what point am I gonna walk into my doctor's office and they're gonna be like, Anne, this is exactly what you have. Like you're three years away from this, this is what you have. Like there's such a potential there. So the, the thing that I see that's potentially an issue getting us from here to there that we learned with 23andMe was that the regulatory path's not necessarily known. And part of what I'm excited to hear about from all of our panelists here is there's so much potential, but there's not necessarily a clear path forward. So one of the things that we did, we had you know, a well-known warning letter back in 2013. We now have five authorizations. But what was challenging there is, is figuring out what that exact path looked like. And so part of what I, my hope here, and part of the reason I'm so enthused about this, is I feel like there's an amazing amount of potential, but what is that path forward? And I'm super eager to hear all of you here talk about what is the regulatory challenges that you anticipate. So, okay, I'll start us off. And I'm gonna, what I wanna do is just focus. Yeah. So, we're gonna just, so why don't we just quickly go through, introduce yourselves, and then we'll stretch through and we'll each um, give our five minutes. Russ Altman, and you've heard enough from me already today. <laughs> Hi, everyone. My name is Eddie Chang. I'm a neurosurgeon and <clears throat> neuroscientist at UC San Francisco. Hi, I'm Daphne Kohler. I'm a computer scientist by training, was at Stanford, and now I'm leading a company called Incipro. Good afternoon, I'm Kurt Langlotz. I'm a radiologist at Stanford University and uh, lead our Center for AI and Medical Imaging. Great, so I'm gonna uh, kick us off. I'm gonna focus on that middle question which really relates to how do we reduce uncertainty in the regulatory pathway for novel technologies. And I think this is a big issue that many of us that are trying to be innovative in the space are, are facing right now. And I wanna give the context through my own experience over the last decade, and then my high level, high level takeaways of where I think the uh, challenges around uncertainty exist. So uh, I'm a professor here at UCSF in the Neurology, Psychiatry, and Physiology Department. I've navigated through multiple fields of neuroscience over the last 30 years, from uh, molecular to cognitive, and now what I think of as translational neuroscience. And that started, that shift started a decade ago where I really redirected the efforts of my lab to building uh, technologies, uh, so developing them, and then doing the sort of the first validation steps to understand if there was a signal of some impact there. Um, and it began a decade ago when I uh, created a video game, a closed loop video game, so using AI to constantly update the challenges and rewards to target our ability to improve attention in older adults. And the success of that study um, was a publication in Nature in 2013, and that created two events. One was that my lab moved and evolved into a translational research center called Neuroscape here at UCSF to both do technology development and research, and I also co-founded a company, which was a big shift in my life from something you know, I didn't really have experience in. And the company is called the Killy Interactive, and our goal is to translate the research that we did here at UCSF into treatments that reach patients. Over the last eight years, Achille has built a way um, uh, more comprehensive digital medicine solution on that basic technology that we reported on in that Nature paper, and has also advanced uh, over a dozen clinical trials to look for clinical efficacy and safety. But what's most relevant to this discussion is that we um, have engaged with the FDA closely and have aligned on a uh, large, prospectively designed, multi-site, double-blind, randomized control trial on a video game treatment uh, for children with ADHD. That study is completed. Uh, uh, proud to report the results. Uh, we reached our, our endpoints with an extremely low side effect profile. Um, and we are now in the uh, review process at the FDA for class two medical device approval. Um, candidly, the process has been slower um, and a little less interactive than we had expected. Um, but we are hopeful that we will reach um, an agreement on a label to get this to market. But uh, my perspectives from now having gone from academics 
uh, to work as uh, an entrepreneur to the regulatory process has been uh, several. The more, more specific is that while I believe on the policy side, we've seen responses to the changing landscape happen in leaps and bounds, um, I believe that it's incumbent upon the review side of the process to also meet those same standards. And I know it's a, a complex transition, but one that I think is incredibly important. Policy alone won't, won't do it. We need the whole review process on board. Uh, from a higher level, I think what's been most um, impressive upon me is to realize how deeply embedded we all are in the paradigms that we um, enter these uh, processes in and how opaque the walls are such that it's very often hard to see outside of the wall you're in. In, in our case, that paradigm is that a pill should hopefully be able to effectively and safely treat complex conditions of the brain. But uh, we know that that model is far too simplistic, and we also know that uh, it has created a rather narrow and fixed mindset. A paradigm dictates everything. The questions we ask, the predictions we make, how we design our experiments, the methodology we use, and importantly, how we interpret our results and our outcomes. And so I would say that the message for um, innovators, whether uh, inventors or scientists, whether in academic or industry, is that we need to closely and interactively work with the FDA to find these walls. They're often not very clear where they exist. Sometimes you think you're changing one thing. No one's changing one thing. If you're changing one thing, you're changing multiple things. And we need to challenge and question every single assumption if we're going to advance and facilitate change in a rigorous but healthy manner. So I'd say that's one of the uh, things I'd like us to think about is the paradigms win and how hard it is to lead to change across all of them. Russ? Yeah, so I, I love what Adam just said. Uh, I'll try to keep my, I will keep my comments very short. In terms of that second question, just to building on it, I'm a very simple person and it's, it's what we've learned at the CERCI is that a lot of what uh, is missing when you have an innovative new therapy or new device is a guidance. There's no FDA guidance on X, and you need a guidance to exist, or you want one. And I'm, I'm guessing there wasn't a guidance for your type of project, or it wasn't hitting exactly right. So what do you do? You have to meet with the FDA early, I'm, and I'm saying really basic stuff, and then I'll be quiet. You, you meet with the FDA early, and you encourage, and this is the hard part, you encourage your competition to also meet with the FDA early, because when they see two, three, four companies coming in wanting guidance on X, guess what? They write guidances, and they're very good at it, and they take it very seriously, and they're as thoughtful as they can be, and they're often data limited. That's where regulatory science comes in. I'm a big fan of guidances because they tell us exactly where knowledge is falling off the cliff and where it then needs to be extended by, by somebody. Um, so again, these are obvious things and they're very hard to implement, but I'm a fan of early engagement with the FDA and having the whole industry engaged, not single companies, because that's what gets them to then think, we need to come out with some statements. Uh, the only other thing I'll say on the first question is that I'm a big fan of AI. Uh, I'm spending a lot of time on AI, and I think you can get into very stressful future scenarios about the use of AI, which I don't want to get into right now. What I think is, it, for, but for that question about successful examples uh, for evaluation of medical products, AI is very good at seeing patterns, and so for defining sub-phenotypes that are meaningful and definable and reproducible, AI-type technology should be extremely useful for taking a very heterogeneous group of patients, potential subjects in a study, and figuring out which ones are similar and therefore which ones might deserve to be grouped together in a treatment arm or a control arm. So I think you should assume that AI will be very good at that very soon. And there's many other things to say, but I'll stop. Eddie? You're next. Great. Um, like I said, I'm a neurosurgeon at UCSF. Uh, I specialize in taking care of patients where it involves brain mapping in order to preserve function and to really optimize the outcome for patients. And one of the things that really struck me early on in my training was that we don't really have a lot of therapies that get people better. We have a lot that actually stop people from getting in trouble or out of emergencies, but not a lot that can actually restore uh, nervous system function. And that's when I really became interested in trying to develop engineering uh, techniques, in particular neural interfaces that can interact with the nervous system to restore loss function. And this has been very synergistic with our, uh, our research enterprise uh, and, and human patient volunteers who have 
really been uh, the source of data and inspiration for a lot of the work we do. So just to be specific, uh, some of the projects that we've been working on in particular uh, on the basic science side have been trying to understand what is the neural code of speech and language. And what I mean by that is essentially the electrical code that uh, neurons use to actually communicate, let's say for example, the words that you're hearing from my mouth. And uh, about five years ago, we were able to describe what that neural code looks like for every consonant and vowel in the English language. And when we, we came across that discovery, we thought, well, let's turn this back. Let's try to figure out how to translate this into something that may benefit people. And if we did, in fact, really understand what that code is for every speech sound in, in English, can we build a device, basically, that can translate that neural activity in someone's brain to help people who are paralyzed? So that's what we've been working on for the last five years. Um, our strategy, as opposed to trying to commercialize this outside the university, we've been very much encouraged and supported by the university to actually to de-risk the technology as much as we can within the campus. Uh, it's a really exciting time for people who are working in the, in, in the neurosciences to think about how we can bring the engineering on campus. And from our perspective, it's actually been very, very positive uh, interactions with working on IDE um, to build uh, early stage uh, products that, of course, because of how high you know potential risks there are, because they're implantable devices in the nervous system, but it's been tremendously powerful enabling for us to do this within the university, to take it to patients, uh, de-risk it, and um, really focus on the most important things, which is the efficacy and, and the safety devices in a setting. And one of the final points I want to make with all of this was that the technology that we have available to us, at least in the neurosciences, um, it's, it's, it's very outdated. For example, uh, for our Parkinson's patients, we use essentially 30 to 40 year old cardiac pacemaker technology. And this is, we're talking about the brain. So, you know, and it's not that the engineering doesn't exist to create better devices. One of the things that I, I realized early on, in fact, the engineering does exist, but the problem does, is that the brain is something very unique. You can't build models uh, of the brain in industry to test some of this stuff out, like companies like Medtronic have been able to do with cardiac diseases. There's just no good model for things like depression and serious neurological diseases. So one of the things that we're really pushing forward was the model of how to de-risk a lot of this in the academic center. Uh, instead of going out to find um, the engineering, we're actually bringing a lot of it to campus and trying to bring it as close to the patients and to the physicians as possible to de-risk and get it as far as we can before uh, uh, commercializing and exiting. So it's a little weird for me to be on this panel since I've had no exposure to the regulatory process whatsoever, and so my ability to opine on it intelligently is very limited. So I'm going to focus on uh, the broader picture and maybe mention a little bit about where I see this fitting into the regulatory process at the very end, but I'll also keep this short. So um, as I mentioned in my introduction, I'm a machine learning person by training. I've been doing this for long before this became popular, so back as early as the early 90s, and applying it to biomedical data sets pretty much when biomedical data sets started to emerge with the first microarray data in 1999, 2000 or so. so um, well aware of the challenges and opportunities, I think, of really applying machine learning techniques to what is becoming an increasingly interesting and exciting data modality, especially in the last few years. Um, in the current work that we're doing, we're really trying to take a fresh look at the drug discovery and development process, where I think the analogy that I currently have is that it's a very long, multi-year, sometimes multi-decade, road where there are multiple forks in the road where one fork, if you're lucky, is going to get you to a good outcome in 99 or not. You have only the very vaguest notion at most of those which is going to be the good fork versus the bad ones. And it sometimes takes you three to five years and tens of millions of dollars, if not more, to find out. So the question is, can we use machine learning with the right data to help us provide a better compass that will get you to the better forks more often than we're currently getting with the heuristics that we've had. And those forks exist all the way from the very earliest stages, which is which genes do we even target? 
in which patients, all the way through to how do we design a compound that has good properties that will allow it to be well developed, well absorbed, non-toxic, all the way through to which patients do we actually give this to, how do we characterize, how do we leverage the heterogeneity that, um, that Russ mentioned so that we avoid the current failures of many of the existing trials where we do an all-comers or roughly all-comers trial and try and treat all um, patients with that probably have multiple diseases with one drug. And I think there is so many opportunities for better machine learning to be applied at these different stages um, so that we no longer are basically failing because we are taking the wrong fork in the road in so many of those different uh, areas and, and are getting to the point where we are now paying, what is it, $2.6 billion per successful drug. So the goal is how do we create those predictive models? And I think the challenge to the community as a whole is that machine learning, while an incredibly powerful tool, is only as good as the data that you feed it. Uh, there's a lot of people in the world who are trying to take shortcuts in uh, let's use the data that's out there, massage it, clean it up, and pretend that it's good. Uh, my take is that these are rarely successful, and especially in an area as fraught with risk and costs as drug, de drug development, where a failure is so costly, investing upfront and getting the right data to really feed these models is a very worthwhile investment. So a lot of what we do, and I'm happy to talk about it later, is how does one construct really good data sets that one can use to both feed machine learning models and equally important to evaluate the quality of the machine learning model in a rigorous way on an unseen data set that is separately generated from the one that you use for training so that you have some semblance of confidence that you did not overfit to some artifact that occurred in your data set and that it will actually generalize to a much larger population of, um, of patients, say. So, um, and that and maybe uh, the last point is bringing this back to regulatory pathways. This is a place where I think the FDA could play a really interesting role in creating an opportunity for evaluation of various tools along this process in a way that was um, rigorous and leverage some of these insights that machine learning people are currently employing, which is if you have a model system for disease, for toxicity, for um, manufacturability, for safety, can you evaluate those tools in the same way that we evaluate things in other contexts, which is the FDA has its own sort of held out test cohort, if you will, and ask yourself, does the tool, whether it's a biomarker, whether it's a toxicity predictor, whether it's whatever, can that make predictions on a data set that the person who developed the tool was not uh, given access to? Um, I talk oftentimes to people who are building model systems, oftentimes it's animal model systems, and you ask them, how predictive is this? to outcomes in human? And the answer is, well, not very. It's like, okay, what does not very mean? It's like, I don't know, no one's ever even measured that. The question hasn't even been asked quantitatively, how predictive is this tool, which everybody uses for efficacy or toxicity, how predictive is this to outcome in humans? We don't know. So wouldn't it be nice if we actually had quantitative measurements for predictiveness of whatever model system that we're using so that people could then develop and optimize to those. And that might also enable the development of better tools. So uh, I'm gonna stop here. I know it's a somewhat provocative statement, but um, I think building predictive models and helping the community make them better is just an important way that the FDA can play a role. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here all with you today. Um, what I'd like to do is use my time to talk about the incredible progress that's been made in the application of AI machine learning to image analysis and the implications of that for the regulatory space. So how many people here know about ImageNet? Okay, so not that many. So ImageNet is a database of about 14 million natural scenes, each of which has an object in it. 
It was put together by Fei-Fei Li, who's a professor of computer science at Stanford. And a competition is held each year to look at uh, which algorithms are best at identifying those objects. And in 2012, the error rate was about 25%. And then if you look at what happened over the next five years, the error rate went down and continued to go down and reached about 2.5%. So by a factor of 10, the error rate decreased and was reaching really uh, human level performance. When those of us in medicine saw that, we immediately recognized this was a great application, the same kind of technology that can recognize a street sign for a self-driving car application or a face on Facebook can recognize whether a tumor is present in the lung or what a tumor is doing in the liver. So I got very excited about applying these, uh, these technologies. So we uh, developed this Center for AI and Medicine and Imaging uh, at Stanford. Uh, and that was about 18 months ago. We now have over 100 affiliated faculty across 20 departments in three schools, all developing these new machine learning methods and applying them to medical imaging to build applications to help people like me, radiologists and other medical imagers, to reduce our error rates and improve our consistency. It's also spawned an incredible industry so I serve on the board of an organization called Radiological Society of North America, which is the large radiology professional group. We hold the largest medical meeting in the world the week after Thanksgiving in Chicago every year, 53,000 people, eight football fields of trade show space. This year, we had to open up a new hall just for the AI vendors. There were over 100 radiology AI vendors exhibiting uh, this December. So an incredible industry, there are about 30 to 40 of these um, algorithms that have been cleared for doing things like detecting masses in the breast or hemorrhage in the brain or uh, nodules in the lung. There's interesting implication there though, that's the numerator, so what's the denominator of all of the different tools that we could build to help radiologists? One of my colleagues, Chuck Kahn at the University of Pennsylvania did some work on the materials that we use to study for our board certification and counted that we probably have to be aware of about 20,000 different conditions in the human body. Radiologists trained to recognize these. So you see the problem there, you look at that, you multiply by the different modalities that we have, MR, CT, ultrasound, radiography, PET, and so on, and that's a lot of algorithms. So that poses a regulatory challenge, very interesting to talk about how you might solve that. But I wanted to end with one other uh, kind of important challenge or interest, I think, in the regulatory space, and that has to do with something called RESIST. Who here knows what RESIST is? Okay, more. So RESIST is an algorithm by which human radiologists or others could look at an image and measure the disease burden, and it's really used to calculate, uh, using imaging as an intermediate endpoint or surrogate endpoint, uh, whether a uh, pharmaceutical or some other intervention is, is working. And the way this works is you choose a certain number of target lesions, you measure them, typically only in one dimension, and then you add it up and use a formula to decide is this disease progression, is it, you know, is it not, that sort of thing. A lot of good work to show that there's high variability in how humans measure those lesions. It's high variability in which lesions get chosen. And so there's an incredible variability in the system of how we decide whether disease is progressing or not. And by the way, this is not the most rewarding work for radiologists. And it's not so easy to incorporate into the clinical world. So couldn't we use a machine learning algorithm to first try to replicate what Resist is doing and do it in a more consistent way, and then perhaps even build a better algorithm that would more holistically measure disease burden that would be more correlated with the outcome, be a better surrogate, and actually would be more easily incorporated into the clinical care so that our clinical systems and our research systems could be working in concert. So I'll stop there. Thanks. I love all these companies. I love all the work that you guys are doing. Um, so I just, I wanna open it up for questions now because I think there's probably a lot of interesting questions out there. Hi, uh, my name is Aditi, and I, I actually had two quick questions again. My first question is for Daphne, and I think what she said gave me chills, because I have in heard... In a good way, I hope. <laughs> in a good way, in a really good way, because I've heard this a lot of times. You know, you, 
you go to talk to someone who's on the clinical development team, is trying to figure out the dosing for a certain patient population, and they have toxicology data in hand, animal data in hand, and they still say, you know, whatever happens in humans is gonna look very different. And I think part of the issue here is incentive. Because a lot of times when you do a development, the end goal is getting the drug registered and getting it commercialized. There is never that feedback loop of whatever happened in the clinical study, those data is ever going back to the preclinical group for them to take a look at what's going on. It's almost through going through drug development as a phasic exercise and you hand it over to the next group <laughs> and you just hear the good news when it happens, but you never get to see anything else. So I guess one of my questions is, do, do you envision that there's pro the potential that at some point when that data does go back to the preclinical group and they do develop some sort of a predictive mo you know, system, how long it would take to develop a system, what would be the acceptability criteria for it, and is this potentially something that a company can take to FDA and say we have developed this predictive system, we have done some trials that tell you that the real-time data and the data coming out of the system is very comparable, and now if we choose to develop this molecule further in the next decade or you know, overall, we can use this predictive molecule and potentially forego some aspects of animal testing. So I think that's a wonderful question. Let me maybe start with the first part of your comments. I think the siloism that exists a lot throughout a lot of the drug development process is a truly pernicious problem and has been the cause of many of the issues that we see. It exists actually on all sides. I've, I've worked with people who were at early stage in, in drug discover in, in pharma companies who tried to get access to data and were told that they couldn't get it. And I've also talked to people on the clinical side who said, I wish there was someone to analyze these data for me. And no one in preclinical seems interested. So I've heard both sides of this story. It's actually really sad the, to see that lack of communication. Uh, and I think it's one of those things that we really need to avoid and data sharing, and especially when it comes to human data, which is probably the single most precious thing that's hardest to reproduce at scale, the more readily you can make that available to a broader community, and I understand the challenges, and it's one of those things that you can just throw up your hands in the air and say, okay, we just don't know how to deal with it, or you could say, let's work through them and figure out how to make that possible. I think that would be transformative to the industry. So as to your second question, I do think that to me would be the hope, that is, given um, actual outcome data for human trials, if you could say, I'm developing a tool that based on whatever ensemble of preclinical data that's available to me, some of those might be biochemical assays, cell-based assays, um, some set of animal models, whatever, can I make predictions on whether a compound will be toxic and for which patients, because toxic is not a thing. It's not that a compound is either toxic or not. Oftentimes there is a small group of patients that experience significantly adverse side effects. If we could identify those and take them out of the group that's allowed to, to um, benefit from a compound, maybe a bunch of compounds that are currently not approved could actually be useful for a group of people. So I think if you could make predictions, it comes back to this notion of machine learning is about building predictive models. If you could build a model that would predict this compound is going to be effective and non-toxic for this group of patients, that would be, I think, transformative and would be something that the FDA could potentially, in an ideal universe, test. That is, here is a group of patients that the model wasn't used to train on. We have a clinical trial. Did the model make the right predictions on those patients? I think that would be an amazing way of really bringing machine learning into the regulatory process. So is it just the concordance between the real time and what predictions the, mo mod yeah. the model made actually become the acceptability criteria? Yes, for exactly. It's you. The model makes predictions before the experiment was done, and then you do the experiment, and was the model right or wrong? Okay, that makes sense. And I, I think we, that's second. I think we need to, we have to switch. Awesome. One question. Laura. Yeah, thanks. So um, I think the work that you guys describe actually, uh, again, highlight the importance of needing to integrate care and research and have tools to allow you to do that. And would be interested to hear what Dr. Change, Dr. Langlotz, or, or even Russ, you have experienced the same thing. So the idea that you could have an AI tool or um, Adam, even you as well, if you have an AI tool that you're studying in a trial, and you want the clinicians to be able to use it, our current state of the art, or lack thereof, of, of electronic records do not allow that data to come back into 
the care process for people to see it. And, you know, for example, when we're trying to make a decision about whether people can go to the OR early because they've had a complete response, I want to use the machine read on the MR volume change <laughs> and, uh, and combine that with a clinical biopsy. Um, this is going to be just like a heroic... I won't show, whatever, uh, you know, that it will be to try and get that data integrated because the rules are you can't get the data back in. And I, I think there should be something in the regulatory process and the clinical care process. Maybe this should be the regulatory way that we think about electronic records, that, the, that we should demand and insist on getting uh, data to be able to seamlessly flow back and forth because otherwise it's going to truly limit our ability to, to do the kind of trials that we want to do. I'm just interested in your thoughts. If I could just say, I totally agree with you, but there are legitimate concerns about leakage of information that then biases the process. So one of the things we do is we look at social media data, which you know you, that's way out there in terms of its utility. But believe it or not, patients on Twitter and on Facebook are actually announcing their side effects and they're announcing their efficacy, and you can mine that. The problem is if there's a thing on the news, on the CBS News or on you know, wherever people get their Instagram, uh, uh, that could affect the signal that you see. Because people say, yeah, yeah, I had that too, I had that too, and all of a sudden there's a spike in the signal. And similar things could happen in the EHR. Um, so I'm not saying that I'm not a fan. I am. But they, we need to grow basic foundational statistical methods to simultaneously allow new data to come into the system while correcting for the biases and stuff that may be introduced by that process. Nonetheless, I have confidence we can do it. Maybe I'll make a brief comment. Uh, many years ago, here on this campus, Sue Desmond Hellman, a former chancellor, was uh, giving a talk, and uh, she was saying how drugs are never, you know, pharmaceuticals are never not in a study. When, when the FDA approval process is, on, is over, they're still being studied, right? There's rare side effects that show itself over time. We understand efficacy better. And it was just a really helpful way for me to hear, you know, that process doesn't end. It's not something's approved and then it's just out there. And I think that this is another really exciting use of all the data and sensors uh, that we have right now is to really open our minds to what it means to be in post-market and what we do with that data in, in terms of our understanding and depth of what it does good and what it does bad, how, how patients themselves learn about how it's, um, it's impacting them. And so I, I do think there's a tremendous opportunity there. It's, it's what we already believe that we do, but this is, uh, this is the pathway to do it better. Yeah, and I would add, I think uh, today a lot of the imaging we do is routine clinical images that we obtain, but as part of a clinical trial also. And so that's really the low-hanging fruit, is, the, is there a way that we can um, make the conclusions that radiologists give more consistent as part of the clinical process and have that also be more useful in, in the clinical trial process? Uh, hi, I'm Doug Milliken. I'm a statistician with AccuData Solutions. And I have a question for uh, Drs. Langlotz and Kohler. Uh, in my experience with uh, medical imaging uh, studies and uh, new, new AI-based platforms uh, developed for medical imaging basis, uh, one of the difficulties that I've come across is that there's more than one truth, the determination of truth. And uh, what seems to be absent is uh, that there, you could get different answers from different radiologists. So uh, clinically speaking, there's the impression that there's only one truth, but in fact you could get a range of answers uh, from any one image. And it seems like, uh, at least in my experience, the, uh, the regulatory aspect does not take that kind of variation into consideration. It only takes into consideration the variation of the readers and the variation of the uh, predictive models across subjects. But when com com determining uh, how well that prediction is, uh, the bar that is setting for that prediction is based on how well does it correspond to truth without taking into account the variability of truth. Mm -hmm. And I guess I'd like your comments on your experience mm -hmm. and how you've handled that, whether you've observed that yourself and how you've handled that yeah. dilemma. Most definitely observed it. A high variability in radiologist interpretation that's been shown over and over again across modalities and imaging types. 
I think we think of, when we do AI experiments, we think of truth basically in two categories. One category is, let's take a lung nodule. Is the lung nodule present in the lung? The right place for that is the radiologist, who are likely going to agree, I mean, whether there's a nodule in the lung or not. We can certainly develop a panel of experts who would be able to do that. And there really is no other good way to do that, short of biopsying everyone, which we wouldn't want to do. The second category is, is that nodule cancer? That's not, there will be a lot of uh, variability in what radiologists think about that as well, but that's the natural inherent uncertainty of the imaging test. And so the way to resolve that is to go to the electronic record and say, you know, does this case, did this patient end up developing lung cancer? What did the biopsy show and those kinds of things? So in the former case, we developed some statistical methods that essentially use the AI algorithm and compare its variability relative to the group to the human radiologists relative to the rest of the group. And that can give you a good measure of whether that algorithm is living up to human performance. So I agree with everything that uh, Kurt said, so I'm not going to repeat it. Um, I think ultimately an ideal goal would be really to train the algorithms not to what a physician said when looking at the electronic health record or the image or the patient's symptoms, but rather the long-term prognosis, um, which I think you know, five years survival in the case of cancer, for instance, is a much better end outcome, although harder to get than just what the physician annotated. I think the problem actually runs deeper than that, though. When you come to places where the, where whatever the annotation is, is so intrinsically subjective and oftentimes just probably even to the wrong taxonomy. So to my mind, the poster child of that is everything in the CNS space and certainly everything in neuropsych where the, um, physician annotations to the existing taxonomy of mental health is probably completely wrong as we're now starting to understand when we look at the genetic data and the extent to which there is overlap between the genetics of things that are sort of different diseases versus, and at the same time heterogeneity in the genetics even within things that have been viewed as one disease. So I think that creates a challenge that is even deeper because it's not at that point about inter-annotator agreement. It's about that what they're annotating towards is just oftentimes the wrong thing. And I think that is a much bigger challenge. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for your comments. <coughs> uh, Car <coughs> Pardon me, Carl Peck. NDA partners and uh, UCSF. Um, in the program that I mentioned this morning, the, the, the GDUF-funded uh, generic drug research program, there have been two very interesting applications of uh, machine learning. One of them involved um, resource allocation. In this project, uh, a large database concerning the um, patent Ex the, the patent dates and the exclusivity dates were collected on uh, drugs yet still under exclusivity or, or under patent protection um, and their market value. And this was thrown into the machine learning algorithm to, to uh, predict the likely dates of arrival of the first ANDA. And that, that outcome then has been used by the Office of Generic Drugs for resource planning, for hiring and allocation of tasks to the various uh, divisions within the, within the uh, within the division. They, I, I think, an, an amazingly e excellent regulatory research outcome that uh, will help to uh, advance. I wonder that Janet may want to comment on this whether this has been applied in 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 the new drug section. Um, she's chatting, so she wouldn't hear the question I asked. So, <laughs> um, so I asked whether machine learning was being used in CEDAR to, de to develop resource allocation as it is in generic drugs. Not yet, okay. Um, the other was uh, a, uh, application of machine learning and AI uh, as an alternative to the frequentist approach for survival analysis. Both of these two applications have been published, and uh, in the latter shows that the, the machine learning is actually a, a, a less biased, more robust methodology. So I just wanted to mention these two very novel applications. Uh, so don't think FDA is out of the loop on uh, AI and machine learning. I feel like I agree with you about the promise here, but I feel like I have to highlight the uh, science article that appeared a couple of weeks ago where um, 
uh, a major employer was actually unwittingly giving out resources in a biased way because the input data to the model about who to, to give resources to had an underlying bias basically against African Americans that led to them getting less resources. Mm -hmm. So that was, it was great that that was published though because it's a perfect example. This was not done purposefully and in fact people were trying to avoid bias. And so it just stresses how important these data sets are, and real-world evidence is going to have mm -hmm. real-world bias in it. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's a real contemporary challenge. Uh, <coughs> Steve Goodman, uh, Stanford. So I, I teach a course, actually. I'm right in the middle of it right now uh, on how to evaluate diagnostic and predictive technologies. Uh, there are about 15 students in it, and I mention that because there probably should be 500. Uh, because almost every single student at Stanford, one way or the other, uh, but those in stats, those in CS, uh, you, you name it, seem to be uh, involved in developing some sort of predictive tools. And uh, if there's any doubt about that, you just have to read the Stanford report every day, and two out of three of the reports are something predicts something, something predicts something, as though that is a scientific achievement. Um, <laughs> so. <laughs> <clears throat> what, and in fact, if you use these tools, it's Im almost impossible that you won't find that. In fact, you, you, you must be not very good at using these tools if you don't find that something predicts something. So <laughs> I actually am, I would not, even though I work in statistics, I would not consider myself an expert in ML or AI, and yet I consider myself an expert in how to evaluate them. So what I teach the students the very first day and every audience I talk to this about, and I'm just going to ask you to react to this statement. So it's a question, it's, gonna be, it's, a, it's a statement uh, disguised as a question because I want to make sure I'm saying the right thing. Um, uh, most of the, I ask them what's the purpose of these technologies and they'll say to minimize errors, to correctly diagnose, to predict. And I tell them every single, the, every single one of those answers is wrong. That's only the first step in a complex mechanism. And the purpose of these technologies is to make patients better at the end of the day in those in whom you use it in a specific decisional context and then in those you don't. And yet that is not generally understood or taught as part of the evaluation pathway. In fact, there are, there are phases of development of, of evaluation of these that are identical to therapeutics, phase one, phase two, phase three, phase four. We would know instantly after a phase one therapeutic trial that that is not ready for you know, the market, and yet routinely a phase one trial or evaluation of a diagnostic or predictive is, is, di is accuracy. That's not ready for prime time, and yet the last sentence in almost all of these papers is, let's start using it because look at the sensitivity and specificity. It fails about five other criteria where it has not established those. So my question, so it's for this reason that the vast majority of predictives that are being used for actionable uh, 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 decisions about patients. So I'm not necessarily talking about the image analysis, although it indirectly affects that by, by reducing the number of errors. Um, so what I tell them is that almost all of these fail in the marketplace. You don't end up seeing them in the pathway because they actually haven't ever been tested against this bar. And when they do, they often fail either because they don't add very much to what we know already because they're incredibly expensive, incredibly complex. At the end of the day, or they're not used properly, the informational systems are not proper. So my, the, the statement I'm going to make, but I'd like you to react to it, is the vast majority of these designed for decision making have not been evaluated to make it apparent that they actually improve anything about the patient welfare. And that if we went through that process just like we do with drugs, then we might be able to decide which AI and which prediction tools actually were good to embed in the EHR or in the record or whatever. And by the way, it has to be tested in the EHR in exactly that setting to be able to say that it would be better off. So I, I would submit that we do have a pathway. Nobody uses it. Nobody's being taught it. I went, that's too extreme. But it's very rarely put through that pathway because it's too hard and your company gets bought after your diagnostic test accuracy is established. So there's the statement. I'd love to get a reaction. So <clears throat> I guess I'd start by saying uh, radiologists have a fairly narrow view of the clinical care process, uh, and yet we are able to evaluate the diagnostic value of the tests that we do in our own you know, human interpretation methods. So 
I do think that if we can show that uh, we know that the error rate of radiologists is between three and six percent of clinically significant errors, and if you can build a technology that can reduce that, I think there's true it's a surrogate for outcome, but I think you could make a pretty clear case that that is improving the care process overall. So I think that's how we look at it, not ignoring the fact that we want to do those outcome studies and how does image, imaging correlate to outcome, but they're just very hard to do, forget about AI, just generally the work that radiologists do, it's very hard to show outcome effects except for screening types of tests. Typically. I do want to say that I sort of carve out radiology because it already has a specific place within the <clears throat> care pathway. So it has a little different characteristics than some of the other things I'm talking about, which is a sort of a new piece of information, a new assay, uh, in a way very different than, than radiology. But the other thing I would say is that, <clears throat> you know, totally with you on the issue of bias and the, that the rules of bias aren't repealed because a computer scientist is looking at a machine learning training data set versus an epidemiologist looking at a clinical trials data set. Those are subject to the same issues, and in fact, the stakes are higher because for the clinical trial data set, that'll get published, and then you'll have a physician dealing with a single patient and making a decision about whether to adopt that pharmaceutical for that patient. For machine learning, you have an algorithm that's gonna be generating judgments over and over and over again, sometimes in a rather opaque way, so the stakes are, are higher. Nobody else? Anyone else? I can't believe that. Well, I'm, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm trying not to talk too much, uh, <laughs> but I'm filled with opinions. Uh, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm breaking this down into uh, diagnostics that make positively bad and damaging, uh, the ones that actually help. And, and what I would help would mean, and you, if this was implied in your comment, is that gives information to a physician or a care provider who then does something with it that leads to a better outcome than if they didn't have that piece of information. But then I think un uh, it's likely that most of them are actually neutral. They just don't add anything or enough. And, and that could be a very expensive. And so part of me says, well, the market will decide. So you if you want to be a market person, you say, well, as long as there's no harm, you let this diagnostic loose. And eventually, the providers will figure out it's doing absolutely nothing to their performance, and they'll stop ordering it. I don't know if that will happen, though, because there's other things like marketing and uh, so uh, it doesn't think, work for drugs, by the way. Right, exactly. So I, I'm, I'm cautiously w worried about that response. Uh, thank you. Thank you to the panel. I'm Andrew McKee from Headland Strategy Group. Uh, earlier this morning, there was a, a request, I guess, voiced for novel surrogate uh, endpoints. And I was wondering, maybe it's a question for Kurt, but for the panel, are there particular disease processes or end organs that are most ripe for the plucking from new AI and machine learning technologies, for, specifically for new product development uh, for new surrogate endpoints? That's a challenging one. I, mean, I guess the, I'll tell you, in our center, we're not very high on building algorithms for things that humans don't already know how to do that the, somehow the AI is going to find some amazing association between things that humans in decades of looking at these images haven't figured out in some way, right? So the only exception to that, I would say, is that <clears throat> uh, clinical radiologists generally don't get much feedback about the genomics of tumors or of the human being behind the tumor. And so I think those linkages now are being made for the first time, and we, you know, we as humans haven't really had any ability to learn from those associations yet. So there's probably some fertile ground there. Um, so that would be my answer. I, I think there is a significant opportunity there in at least a couple of different ways, and there's probably others, but two that come to mind is there is a lot of data that one can now measure, even from a simple vial of blood, that we're now starting to see as a significant biomarker of potential of a potentially very large number of diseases. I mean, most obviously the immune system related diseases, but not only, and even um, a broader range of diseases often manifest in subtle and interesting ways in immune system cells and uh, the TCR repertoire and so on. And I think developing that as a set of predictive biomarkers for disease state and disease progression, I think could be very interesting and allow us to discover earlier in the process whether patients are or not responding to treatment. Um, I think one that's 
emerging maybe a little bit further behind but has a lot of potential is honestly anything that measures patient longitudinal uh, response in a much denser and more quantitative way than the physician ascertained sorry, once every three or six month visit. So for instance, if you think of diseases like neurodegeneration and measuring things like cognitive decline, or for that matter, motor neuron decline, where the current tests are very subjective, often they're uh, questionnaires or artificial settings where you kind of have the patient walk 10 meters and measure by eye whether they're walking better or worse than what you remember from the last visit six months ago. I don't think those are particularly good given the current availability of accelerometers and other things that would allow us to measure this both more densely, more longitudinally, and in the patient's natural environment. Those are not solved problems. The data analysis on this is really hard. These data are really noisy, and there's a lot of variability. But I think the machine learning techniques are now at the point where one can start tackling those if we had enough data available. So I think those are tremendous opportunities. Great, thank you. Yeah, and, and just to follow the thought, in other words, we have, a, say, for instance, apps determining cognitive ability or change, and you might have wearable sensors for... Yeah. Building. Any of those, I think, are more are, are, have the pos potential to be more reliable and relevant than the, the current very sort of sparse and subjective measurements, which are the standard of care even in clinical trials. Great. Thank I had one follow-up, um, if I may, which is with eye disease or with liver disease, where there are a lot of drugs being developed, say, for instance, for liver fibrosis and a lot of recent high-profile failures, and there's a, a seems like reams of ophthalmology I, data. Of let's quickly go to Kathy and then okay. follow up with that yeah, question so afterwards. No, That'd be great. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> oh, thank you so much, Anne, because the question is directed to you. Oh, so, um, <laughs> I'm so lucky. <laughs> Tell me. No, so I, I guess one reason when we put these panels together, this particular one, is that there aren't clear regulatory paths forward for many of the products you are discussing. And now you've had an experience mm -hmm. uh, with DNA diagnostics, um, with, um, with an FDA experience. And now I, I guess I want you to sort of think, you know, now that you've kind of, if you will, led the way and pioneered, you know, what needs to be done by working together with the FDA to get your platform approved. Um, could you have a priori done what Russ said, gotten together with all the DNA diagnostic companies that were doing things yeah. like you, and would that have helped you? And I guess the same question also to Adam, because you're now pioneering some video games. Right. So, yes. So I think that, um, you want to go first? You want to go first. Um, so <laughs> um, I think that actually, you know, in our early days, it was interesting. Like, we've had a long history with the FDA. Um, and, and again, and it's been, it's obviously had its ups and downs. Like, we had, obviously, we, we had discussions in those early days, and we had our 2013 letter. And one of my favorite things to do is we do this class at Stanford. And um, Rob Siegel, who's a professor in the business school, he always asks the question, do you think it was, like, Silicon Valley arrogance or 23 me incompetence that got their letter. <laughs> and I always love sitting in the back of the room and just waiting to see what people are gonna say. And usually it's like Silicon Valley um, arrogance. And I actually say no, it was, it was a lot more on the incompetence side. Um, and so for some of you in the room who've seen the communications from the early days, like it's almost laughable. Um, like, I used to write in, like, hey, FDAers, what's up? Like, you know, <laughs> like, <laughs> there was a little bit, but, um, <laughs> and, you know, Kathy Hibbs, who's sitting right there, who, when she joined the company, she's like, oh, wow. Um, you know, this was after the FDA warning letter. And um, <laughs> so we really tried. I mean, it's one of those things I said. I was like, we really tried. And I look back, like, we um, came up with our own kind of approach. And, um, you know, we worked with the, the agency and we said, listen, this is what we think it could be. Um, and fundamentally, we spoke the wrong language. Like, I don't, again, when the, the communications at some point, I mean, they're all foyable, um, but at some point, like, it's, it's an interesting story because it wasn't for the lack of, it wasn't because we thought we were beyond it. It was really because we were kind of incompetent. Um, and so, and our, our, our partners at the time, um, we all kind of were in the same boat together. And I would say, I would highlight today, we have this 
question. I have like over a hundred competitors, but we are the only ones who've gone through the FDA process. And there is another, you know, there's technically a loophole, like there's the laboratory develop test guideline. So if you want to get, um, you know, the 23andMe Alzheimer's APOE test, like that has gone through and we've worked with the FDA, you can get it. Or you can go to, you know, some of our competitors who have not gone through an FDA process. So I think that's part of one of the things that we have um, learned is that like it's a lot of people are intimidated. Um, a lot of people don't necessarily want to step forward and go through, um, you know, and it is hard. It's work. And, you know, I, I advised to a, a, a little startup group and I remember them all coming and saying, they're like, so there's this like 510K thing. Um, where do I download the forms? And, and you guys all find like, it's, but it, it's kind of a reasonable question. Like a lot of people here kept thinking like, yeah, that's a reasonable question. Like there should be a form, I fill it out and then I get approval. <laughs> Isn't that how it works? And, and that's, I was like, oh no, there's like this whole process and it's a language that you don't understand. Hire someone who understands it. So I do, um, I mean, it's interesting as I think about all these technologies here and I'm really excited about real world data. Like I'm generally like Daphne, I'm so excited about the idea of not having mouse models one day and like having the right kind of data. How do we build it? And part of honestly, like the plug I have for Circe is that there has to be a collaborative environment that comes together that says like, how are we going to solve these problems? Because I fear for you all. Um, like it's, it's at some point Stanford might have a class. It's like, you know, where's it arrogance or, or incompetence? And, and I think it's, it's a challenge. It's a challenge figuring out that right path. And again, I'm really lucky because we did hire somebody who knew the language and it was a lot of back and forth. And to this day, we still, we have a lot of back and forth. So I do, um, like I said, it's the advice I always give is like, it's expect that it's just going to be a lot of hard work. Um, but I do really worry about, I think this is an incredibly important sector yeah. and I worry about it. There's no path. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, let's keep my comments brief because we're sort of at the end of our time. But we, we did seek guidance from the FDA early on and continue to. And, you know, I see a couple of challenges, not just for our company, but for the whole field of, I guess, what we describe as digital therapeutics. And, you know, I'm speaking in the mental health and neuro domain, but it extends beyond that. It's really very different than existing treatments. And not just in terms of the treatment, but in terms of the outcomes that are generated, the experimental design that's used to validate it on and on. And some of the, the two challenges that I've seen are that um, review groups change over time. Um, and these are multiple year projects, so you could wind up with an entirely different group than you started with, which have different biases and different paradigms, and things are not written down so clearly as what your um, pre-specified outcomes are. And it's a, it's a complexity that I think a lot of groups struggle with, is a moving target, and you think you know the target, and then you don't. And then the other is what I mentioned, is that what I believe is a disconnect between the policy side, which is encouraging really aggressive and exciting innovation, and then what we see in the review process, which is not always compatible with that message that we're getting, so. Thank you, and I guess I should adjourn the panel because I think we're over, so thank you all. And we have a break until two, what time? Till 3.05, okay, 2.05, okay, oh, sorry. Okay, thank you. So this is our last lightning talk. Um, this is a, a a research project that was funded by the Office of Generic Drugs focused on those um, inert ingredients, the excipients that are found in all drug products or most. Uh, did I say Brian Choicott? Oh, and our speaker is Brian Choicott, faculty member here um, at UCSF. Hey, I'm, uh, I'm told I have five minutes. Uh, thanks for that introduction. So, um, yeah, this project... <laughs> Kathy knows me too well. Uh, this uh, this uh, project is uh, uh, um, on I excipients. Uh, they're the... Uh, actually, they're the, the primary component of uh, most oral drugs and many non-oral drugs. The uh, API, the active pharmaceutical ingredient, the thing that you think of as the drug, is actually you typically... a uh, a minor component, and um, and they're uh, they're defined certainly in the United States in the, in something called the uh, inactive ingredients database, the IID uh, from the FDA, and um, 
And uh, how they got in there is, is a long story, which I won't go into. They're basically defined by statute and fixed. Uh, they haven't changed or changed very, very slowly, which is actually a problem. But anyways, uh, our, uh, we, we sort of took this idea that the excipients in this database are actually inactive as a provocative hypothesis and uh, set out to test that. And um, this is, as I'll show you, this is a collaboration uh, with my friend and colleague, uh, Laszlo Urban at Novartis. And I'll, I'll show you his stuff in, in a second. We, what, the way we did it is we, we, we took um, the molecular uh, excipients, which means the ones that can be defined by a chemical structure, and, and that was um, built in this, in this database we created, which I'm not going to talk about. And um, well, the first thing we did actually was we just looked at them. And, and as a chemist uh, or a chemical biologist, pharmacologist, when you look at some of the molecules that are defined as inactive, just by looking at them, you know, they don't look that inactive. And so we put it through this computational method that we developed uh, to predict tox targets and off targets and repurposing targets for drugs and, and put the excipients in them. And the way that works is we take each of the molecular excipients. There's, you know, not more than 800 molecular excipients. There, there's more excipients total. And, and um, for each one of them, uh, uh, calculate... Um, targets that, that might exist for them. And the way we do that is we look for, um, we, we compare the chemical structures of the excipients against the known ligands, the annotated ligands, for over 3,000 targets. Uh, the targets and the ligands are defined in, a, in another database, not ours, Campbell database from uh, the EBI. And um, based on their similarity, their chemical similarity uh, to the ligands, for those targets, we say, well, they're more or less likely to bind to the targets of those ligands. And um, to do that, you need, um, you need a model for how similarity. Can you guys see this? I can't see it. OK, good. Uh, 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 you need a model for how ligand similarity predicts target similarity. And, and I'm not going to go through it. Um, it's just to say that you can't use raw similarity alone, just like you can't use raw similarity for sequence calculations, and, and we were confronted by the same problems that, that BLAST, for instance, or CyBLAST is confronted with, and, and, and we used the same, we actually stole the statistical model from BLAST to go from such and so ligand resembles some of the ligands in a set of known ligands for a target to a statistically confident prediction that it will be active or, or, or not active on, on such and so target. Um, so this is just gives you a sense of how those calculations work. This is a uh, uh, propylgallate, which is uh, an inactive ingredient. In, in, uh, it's approved for use. It's in many drugs. It's an antioxidant. And uh, you put um, propylgallate through this method, and, and what comes back are some of the molecules, well, all the molecules that are similar according to it. And, and uh, I don't know if you can see it. Yeah, yeah. So this is propylgallate, and these are several. There, there's many more molecules that uh, are known ligands, it turns out, for this enzyme catechol O-methyltransferase comp T. And this is actually an important enzyme. It's, the, it's one of the enzymes that turns off um, catecholamine uh, uh, signaling, you know, dopamine and epinephrine and, and a few others. Uh, it, it turns off their signaling by, by, um, by, by methylating uh, the catechol groups. Um, and, uh, you know, this, the propylgallate, you know, you can sort of, I don't know if you're close enough, you can sort of see it, lo it looks kind of similar to these and, and actually other ligands. And so you get this predicted E value. It has the same meaning as a, as a blast E value. It's the expectation that this similarity that you see over the whole set uh, would occur at random. And so it's, you know, for those of you who can't see it, it's something times 10 to the minus 13. So a, a fairly confident uh, prediction. And sure enough, uh, it just, this method doesn't always work. I don't, don't go away from the seminar thinking this method is completely reliable. It's not. But it, it's about 50% of the time, and we've now tested it with, uh, with, you know, uh, with Novartis and, and others uh, you know, over 1,000 times. Uh, uh, it, it, it works about 50% of the time. Anyways, it worked in this case. Um, so uh, th this uh, propylgallate, this excipient, turns out to be a 15 nanomolar uh, inhibitor of, of catechol o methyltransfer So that's, that's the same range as, as the, the median of drugs. So most drugs are active on their targets at, at around the 10 to 20 nanomolar concentration range. And 
So, so is propylgallate on catechol O methyltransferase, uh, for instance. Uh, and, and, and we did this over a, 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 you know, a, a fair number of excipients. This is just, I'm sorry, it's, it's too much. I only have five minutes now, about two minutes. Uh, uh, so we, 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 we predicted a lot of them, and, and, and they were all failures. And, but some of, so here's propylgallate here again, and, and, and there's a bunch of dyes. Uh, that, oh, you can't see them very well at all, but a bunch of dyes were predicted, and they, there's a range of activities going, you know, the best was propylgallate, but there were others that hit in the, you know, 100 to 200, 300 nanomolar range, and then some in the micromolar range, and, and, and so forth, against a wide range of targets, and you might think, yeah, well, how convincing is micromolar, but you know, the excipients are there at pretty high concentrations, right? There's more excipient often than drugs, so often, not always, but sometimes micromolar can really be meaningful. Um, I'll just show you uh, the stuff that came from Novartis. Novartis took a, Lazo's group uh, took, this is Lazo Urban, uh, uh, he's head of early talks, molecular talks at, they have a different name, but I think that's what it is. Anyways, 